Silicon Valley does not have the global monopoly on the idea iteration or the creation or execution of great digital businesses. Patrick Rhodes has a big step right there. Now there's no longer the of what the viewers want to watch is local content, local stories, local talent, local creators, local language. And that's this huge void that I think is trying to fill. For you, I created them to fill your void. Piracy is in 95% of homes in our markets. Netflix is not. Damn! So welcome, if we click onto that first slide, welcome to season four of iFlex. So if you've been to Wild Digital before, you've met me, you've heard the iFlex story, you got engaged with the, the vision and the cast of characters in season one, when we're all PowerPoint and big ideas and no experience and no fuck ups yet. If you're a Wild Digital committed person, you came through season two, which was the reality, the toddler rushing around trying to learn who it was, a journey of self-discovery. Season three was naive, massive global expansion. That wonderful moment where you can take over the world, and now welcome to season four. Um, if you're new to Wild Digital, and from the, if everyone in the crowd turns around, you can see the sardines packed in behind you. There's a whole bunch of new faces at Wild Digital, which is, is amazing. If you haven't heard of iFlix, it's, a, it's an understated, humble, quiet streaming service that wants to revolutionize entertainment in Southeast Asia. If you have seen the first seasons, take, stay with me. Season four is the critical season. You're already over-invested in the show, you've sat through the first three seasons, you've binge-watched all the hours. Season four is the one in which a major character dies. It's the pivotal point that we move forward. And so you know all iFlix presentations start with an epic video at the beginning, and then an attempt to sort of create a grand unifying theory which somehow integrates what's going on in Southeast Asia and the enormous amount of change. And so this year's grand unifying theory comes from my time at Microsoft. And I was, had the extraordinary opportunity to spend a few meetings with Bill Gates. And this was something he would say almost every meeting. We overestimate the change that will come in the next two years, and we underestimate the change that's going to occur in the next 10. And so this is the graph that comes out of those expectations. And it's actually the graph of iFlix. It's the graph of the internet boom and bust. But it's that moment where there's that first rush, that adrenaline, that there's something here, there's something game-changing, there's something revolutionary. And the unicorns come, and it's going to be wonderful. And then, shit, it's hard. It's hard, the infrastructure is not there, payments isn't there, churn is high. Devices don't support video, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and then it gets tough. And we go from the heights of naivety, but excitement and enthusiasm towards, oh, man, are we going to get there? And then slowly you work it out. You work it out, and expectations continue to build. Uh, I just heard Bitcoin is back at $11,000. It's the same curve. Irrational exuberance, followed by reality, followed by a long, steady march. The interesting thing is that user behavior doesn't look like that at all. So if expectations are a big wobble, user behavior is actually a very, very consistent curve. And so when you map those two things, there's two stages of the process. There's the crying unicorn of, man, it's hard. And then there's the very, very quiet change which is going on every single day. That when you step back from all the noise of fundraising and, and presentations at Wild Digital, it's the change that's going on every single day in our countries where people are shifting their behavior to a whole new paradigm. 
And so at season four, I think we're here. It's the warrior. It's a much more focused business. It's a much more focused industry. When we started in season one, we had over 35 competitors just in Southeast Asia. There's now four. So what's changed? What's changed? What have we learned over those last four years? Here's the first one. I've always talked about millennials as though something that's going to happen in the future. We talk about millennial trends that are going to happen. Here's the problem. After four years of the same shtick, you realize that now you're old, and so am I. If you're above 39 this year, put your hand up. <laughs> this is a millennial room. We don't get it. We're past it. Happy birthday to all the people that are on that cusp today. You are the birth of the millennials. Southeast Asia is a millennial population. Over 60% of the total population is under the age of 35. Millennial is here. It's not something that's going to come in the future. Secondly, as a result, the mobile war has been won and lost. So two years ago, I shared this moment. This is May 1997. Uh, this is just my, one of my favorite moments in history. The guy there who's looking so frustrated is Gary Kasparov. He's the world's greatest chess player. He's the world's greatest human mind. And this is the moment where he screams, I've been rooked, as he storms out because he's finally lost a chess game to a computer. May 1997. And this was the moment that as a society, as a humanity, we got scared. Suddenly computers are going to overtake humanity. The moment of singularity where all that computer processing power changes our society like never before. And I shared two years ago that, oh my goodness, all that computer processing power from May 97 in IBM Deep Blue is now in an iPhone 6. And isn't it amazing that one day it will be in the hands of everybody? Now it's in the hands of everybody. That supercomputer that we grew up with, if you're not a millennial, if you're a millennial, you're too young, is now in the hands of every single one of our customers. And you look at the iFlix service, our friends Xiaomi from China, went from non-existent 18 months ago to now being almost 30% of the market. So mobile wins. We've been sharing this graph for three or four years, and you suddenly forget that we're not here anymore. We're now here. So I'm going to make an announcement mathematically generated that today is the day that Southeast Asia passed 500 million people with a smartphone and a mobile broadband connection. I don't know if it's true. You don't know if it's not. So let's just pretend we're about halfway through those points, and we have half a billion people in Southeast Asia that are all millennials. 80% of them have their preferred consumption device of iFlex on mobile. Mobile's not a companion device, it's the core paradigm. It's the center of people's life, the supercomputer in their hands. And I've watched this. In season one, I shared this photo of what my kids would call family time. Them sitting around with a shared experience. My own life has changed as a father, because that beautiful, naive, sweet little girl that's holding her sister, she and I now have a daily battle. So she sent me this screenshot yesterday. Just, let's just digest this for a second. She sent me this in the middle of the day, excited and proud, to tell me that she was on track to come in under eight hours on her mobile, because the week before, she'd passed 11 hours on a single Saturday. So this week, in the school holiday, she's working to get under an average of eight per day. Mobile for her is not a thing that accompanies her PC, her device, her TV. It is the center of her entire life, Snapchat, Instagram, and she's allowed unlimited viewing on iFlix. The biggest learning, though, and this is one that, that has been very fundamental for me, is that thriving local culture beats global hegemony. We believed when we set out that emerging markets would grow up and look like the West. They grow up and look like the US, that US companies and US models and US mindsets would come to dominate Southeast Asia. Nothing could be further from the truth. Last year, we shared this phenomenon, which is local content is overtaking every other form. And we have expanded that over the last 12 months, and those trends have exponentially continued. Magic Hour was the number one movie in 2007. It broke every record on iFlix. This year, it's the movie version three. It's the series version three. Kale Gangster World, the two top, number three and number kind of seven, all-time grossing box office Malaysian movies. 
the TV series on iFlex exclusively broke every single record. Rise to Power, the story, it's sort of the Me Too moment of the KL gangster world, I guess. It's the rise to power of the female gangster. It has criminal crime, it has, it has violence, it has raw testing of the cultures that we've seen. Possessive. Did really well in the local box office, top 10. Was seen by about 400,000, 500,000 people. Has now been seen by 4 million people on iFlex Indonesia. Complex. We brought Hot Ones, we announced last year at Wild Digital, which is one of the top rating web series. Great, interesting moment of 10 interviews, questions over hot wings that just get hotter and hotter. In iFlex, we brought this man, Mr. Amwai Ibrahim, who is either going to be definitely the next prime minister of this country, or definitely not, <laughs> depending on your perspective. And this is a moment, if you live in Malaysia, you'll actually kind of get this. This is a moment where Maya Karen, who's the most awarded uh, movie actress in Malaysian history, asks, Mr. Imrahim, very respectfully, do you know the price of a Birkin bag or a Hermes pair of shoes? Think about it. What's interesting is this has been the absolute groundbreaker for us. This is a Malaysian show called Noor. This was a collaboration with local Media Prima, which is the local free-to-air station. This is the story, just wait for it. This is the story of an imam in a mosque who falls in love with a prostitute. An imam in a mosque who falls in love with a prostitute. This is a story of local culture that fuses religion and sex in a way that pushes every boundary. Of the people who watched episode one, 92% of people completed episode eight. I shared this last year. Depends how good your eyes are before you see the trend. What we talked about was how beautiful it was that you have unique local cultures that are all so different. And from market to market, we have nothing in common until you realize we kind of do. But last week, I kid you not, look at this. This is a milestone. This is local culture trumping everything else. Churi Churi Sintra is the current top rating catch up drama in Malaysia. Sex has finally been trumped, and iFlix has gone mainstream. Four, data trumps everything now everything, and it's quite hard to kind of get your head around it. We've gone from 6.5 million users last while digital to 19 million users last week. But for each user, there's now about 10 times as much data as there was a year ago. And so there's now an exponential curve where we're seeing 2 billion signals every single day. And I won't bore you with that, but whether it's ratings, it's our, it's our app signals, it's the completion rate, it's the binge-watching intensity, we have an insight into customers now which is far more profound than we kind of ever expected. Every single show is mapped, not just in terms of its consumption, but in terms of its connectivity to other genres and other shows. And this is, is one of two things. It's either the entire iFlix library in Malaysia mapped into a set of six customer cohorts, or it's an art project. I'm not sure which, but what that gives you is now segmentation, which we can map to the psychographics of people. From an advertising perspective, those two billion signals every single day get mapped to are you a grocery buyer? Are you an auto intender for iCar? Are you a drama lover? And at a high propensity, what's your occupation? What's your age? What's your socioeconomic status? And so just lastly, in that journey as we head into season four, there's one thing that just makes no sense to me. And so I'm going to give you two graphs, and you tell me what's wrong. That's the first one. I'm going to keep presenting this every year that Patrick lets me stand on stage. So let's just do this. This is linear television ratings over the last five years. If you're old, and I mean old, not just older than millennials, but old, old. If you're over the age of 65, you're watching more TV than ever before. Now, why is that? because there's twice as many good shows, at twice the budget, with twice as many movies, and it's a golden age of television. If you're under the age of 50, you're watching about the same, but there is a linear progression all the way down, and I can map my children along this path, to basically anyone under the age of about 25 will never change a channel ever again. They don't even know what channel 
nor is on. That's graph number one. Number number two, free-to-wear advertising in Southeast Asia grew by 4.4% last year again. Television consumption is down by 56%, and television advertising grew 4.4% to $4.4 billion. So, I flick season four, the green unicorn. We've stopped thinking about SVOD, we've stopped thinking about Netflix. What we're thinking about is that core entertainment experience where the mobile device and the internet change that's going on in our society is now so profound that it replaces all TV. So, TV is dead, long live TV, and welcome to iFlix season four. Thank you.